Um, no matter what kind of garden you have, no matter what kind of plants you have, chances are you're going to encounter a problem. And the best approach uh, when dealing with garden problems is to have a, what I call an integrated management approach. Um, using a multitude of methods to control those pests and problems before uh, they escalate and before you reach for a pesticide. A pesticide should always be your last option. Pesticides are bad, in fact, we all use them. However, picking the right one, uh, using it correctly is going to be uh, the best approach because it'll be safe for the plant, it'll be safe for you, and ultimately safe for the environment. Um, I wanna mention a couple things before I start the presentation. One, when I use the term pesticide, I'm using it in its broadest sense. Uh, if you look up the definition of a pesticide, that incorporates uh, a lot of things. It can be a weed product, which is an herbicide. It can be an insect product, which is an insecticide. It could be a disease product, which is a fungicide. It can also be an animal control product. Uh, for the essence of this presentation and the time I have, we're gonna focus on insecticides and fungicides. But when I talk about pesticide safety, pesticide storage, that applies to any pesticide. Uh, the second thing I wanna do is actually a shout out to thank uh, Bonai Products Incorporated. They're a local company, they're uh, from Oriskany. Um, they're actually down the road from our county extension and we have a great relationship with them. They've been great to the master gardeners and I just wanna thank them for some of the photographs that you're going to see uh, in this presentation. So with that, I'll get started. These are the objectives of what I'm going to cover tonight. We really can't talk about pesticides without talking about an integrated pest management approach to controlling them. As I said, pesticides should always be your last, op uh, your, your last option when you're dealing with a problem in the garden. So we're gonna talk about um, the safety and storage of disposal of pesticides uh, as well. And this presentation is going to focus on the organic options. Those are your less toxic. Unfortunately, we don't have the, the time to cover every uh, pesticide, so we're gonna focus on the organics. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna leave a slide up that has a lot of places where you can go for help, help on identifying problems, as well as maybe some uh, phone apps that you can use when you're trying to determine what's wrong in your garden. So what is integrated pest management? Well, it's, it's a fancy word. Um, to make it simple, it's a way of thinking and a way of acting when you are approaching a problem in the garden. It's using a multiple faceted approach to controlling pests and using approaches that are good for the environment as well as human health. Integrated pest management is sometimes portrayed in the form of a pyramid, like you see this photograph. The pyramid uh, is composed of a set of steps. Each one of those steps is part of the integrated pest management model. Uh, think of it as climbing the pyramid from the bottom up, um, and you go through each step before you get to the top, which is your last option, you'll notice that a pesticide chemical is your last approach. So to kind of make it simple and talk about each one of those steps, when you talk about the prevention step at the bottom of the pyramid, that typically involves monitoring your garden, knowing when something is wrong, looking out for pests before they become uh, more invasive. A lot of the prevention step is also being able to identify when is it time that I need to have help. If you have one or two bugs, for example, on one plant, that's not as bad as say maybe your entire crop of tomatoes is under attack. Um, you want to look at those thresholds because that's the time where you're going to have to go up uh, the pyramid, so to speak. So prevention is monitoring, identification, knowing what if the insect is good or bad, 
knowing what the disease looks like. Once you've done that, if you can try to be preventative, you may not need to go up to the next step. Cultural sanitation, those steps are so important, I'm gonna cover them separately. Going up the pyramid, we're in the, what I call physical and mechanical options that are available to you. There are many types of traps you can buy. For example, this is a blue sticky trap. Uh, you're probably more familiar with yellow insect traps. A lot of times you'll see those yellow fly papers. Um, traps and barriers are examples of physical and mechanical means. Again, to control a problem without reaching for a pesticide because we didn't get that far up the pyramid yet. Biologics are a really interesting way to control pests and biological elements can be either man-made or they can be introduced in nature. For example, uh, there are a lot of beneficial insects out there. Um, in reality, only 10% of all bugs are bad. Uh, the other 90% are either what's classified as a beneficial or they're benign. When you look at this photograph, this is a spine soldier bug, essentially spearing or capturing a caterpillar. These are the types of uh, beneficials that are available. They're natural in the environment or they're available to be purchased. You could literally purchase beneficial insects. I'll talk about that later in the presentation. Biologics can also be man-made. They can be a form of a pesticide. Uh, typically, they're bacterial uh, related so that the active ingredient is actually a bacteria, a type of good bacteria that attacks bad bacteria. Bt is the most common biological uh, pesticide. Uh, Bt stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. That could be a spelling test all by itself. Um, there are different um, strains of Bt. Some will attack caterpillars. There are strains of Bt that attack mosquitoes, for example. There are even strains that attack uh, uh, diseases. So that once you've exhausted all of these options, then and only then should you reach for a pesticide. So that's what integrated pest management is all about. So I said we were gonna talk about the cultural controls separately. Cultural controls, another fancy term for some um, really common sense garden practices that you can uh, use and practice every day in your garden. One is picking the right place, uh, the right plant rather, in the right place. The site where you put a plant is important. You don't want to put, for example, a plant that likes shade in a sunny spot because chances are you're going to encounter a problem. And I can't underemphasize uh, under the importance of good quality soil. Um, where I am here in Westmoreland, it's, there's a lot of clay around here. And heavy clay, there just aren't a lot of plants that like heavy clay. And so you really want to amend your soil with organic matter, whether that's compost or you can actually purchase uh, what they call soil conditioners to amend your soil and make your soil a better quality because it's all about a healthy plant. A healthy plant is going to be uh, less susceptible to a problem. It's just like people. If we're healthy, we won't get the flu. It's the same thing with plants. You want to try to improve the plant vigor by fertilizing regularly. Um, cultivar selection is important. A lot of plants now are bred to be less pest resistant. Tomatoes is probably a great example. Uh, many tomato varieties are prone to blight. Now breeders are making tomato varieties that are less susceptible um, to blight. So picking the right plant is another type of cultural control. Taking care of your plants and maintenance. Uh, weeds are a magnet for insects to lay eggs. They love laying eggs on weeds. So unfortunately, I wish uh, weeding could be a little easier and less uh, manpower intensive, but it isn't. Weeding is important. Pruning uh, your plants is important. Um, maintenance is it, effective watering is another maintenance concept that gets lost sometimes. 
avoid overhead watering because as we'll talk about later in the presentation, the, the, the wetter your plants are or the more moisture that stays on the foliage, the more prone to plant disease uh, that plant is going to be. So effective watering is a type of maintenance that's important. And then garden sanitation, uh, keeping your gloves and your tools clean. Believe it or not, you can transmit diseases uh, simply by getting those fungal spores on your gloves or on your tools. You should change out your gloves as often as possible and try to keep your tools clean, either with bacterial wipes after you've used them, you can use rubbing alcohol to wipe them down, and also keeping the garden clean. Any fallen leaves should be picked up on a timely basis. Remember, a lot of diseases can overwinter in the soil simply from hanging out on the foliage that drop to the ground. In your vegetable garden, harvesting in a timely manner, picking up any dropped fruits in the garden, those are all hosts for potential problems down the road. So that's a good sampling of the cultural controls that you can do that will prevent um, garden problems from occurring. And so once you've practiced all of that, your first options, as I mentioned, are mechanical options and biological options. So what are some examples? Um, this one is not necessarily for the uh, squeamish type of a person, uh, but handpicking uh, bigger insects is actually a great mechanical way to get your insect population under control. Uh, walking around with a pail with soapy water, a little bit of dish detergent and water. You can hand pick, drop them in the soapy pail, they'll drown. Um, some insects, you can literally shake the, the plant a little bit and let the insects drop into that pail of soapy water. Um, my favorite way to control Japanese beetles, that's, that's the way I like to do it. Um, I know it may sound counterintuitive, but if the plant is not a, a, a delicate one, a, a powerful stream of water will actually dislodge a lot of insects. And believe it or not, once that insect falls off, he can't figure out how to get his way back onto the plant. And so you can get rid of a lot of insects uh, simply by using a shot of water. Spider mites, this is a great option for you. Another, for, another example of mechanical control. I already talked about the insect sticky traps. This is the one you're probably more familiar with. It's yellow in color. There are different colors because certain insects are attracted to certain colors. There are also physical barriers that you could make or buy. This happens to be a photograph of a copper uh, mesh material. You can actually purchase it. Copper, for whatever reason, I don't know the science behind it, but it's good for slug and snail control. It essentially, I guess when the slug or snail comes in contact with the copper, it essentially, um, for lack of another word, electrocutes them. A uh, great way to control slugs or snails, another um, uh, example of a mechanical control. As we get into the biologics, I mentioned that you can actually purchase insects, uh, beneficial insects, or what they call soil nematodes. There are many online companies where you can actually buy insect eggs or you could buy, this is a picture of what uh, soil nematodes look like when you purchase them. They're essentially in their dormant stage. You mix them with water. Uh, soil nematodes, as the name implies, they're sprayed into the soil. They hatch into microscopic uh, worms that attack certain types of insects. Um, there are different types of nematodes that attack different kinds of insects. Um, Probably the one company I can think of off the top of my head that's a great source for this is a company called Gardens Alive. They'll sell uh, beneficial insect eggs or nematodes. Um, with beneficial insect eggs, unfortunately, they don't come with a homing device that guarantees when they hatch that they stay in your garden. They might go over to your neighbor's house, but it's a great biological option before to consider before you go to a pesticide. 
And as I mentioned, biologics can be man-made in the form of a biologic um, pesticide. This happens to be a biofungicide that controls certain blights and mildews. Again, it's a different form of that BT that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but these are, are your first options that you should exercise before you reach for a pesticide. At some point though, you're probably going to have to reach for a pesticide um, or you may want to consider a pesticide. As I said, there's nothing wrong with them as long as you select the right one. Now, as you can possibly imagine, pesticides is a highly regulated business. Um, the overarching uh, rule that controls pesticide use is the FIFRA, which is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. It's enforced by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and sometimes the United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA is involved, the USDA gets involved uh, when it's uh, pesticide use by farmers or organic growers. And then each state also gets involved in the regulating of pesticides. The states determine out of all the pesticides that can be registered by the EPA, the states decide which ones they wanna have that are for sale and for use in their state. In New York State, this is governed by the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation. So those are your regulatory agencies. And then there's the National Pesticide Information Center. If you wanted one source of information, I would highly recommend that you put the National Pesticide Information Center in your search engines on your computer and bookmark it. The, the NPIC is just a vast wealth of information on anything and everything a homeowner would want to know about pesticides. Uh, NPIC is actually a collaboration between the EPA and Oregon State University's Extension Service. And so Oregon State University provides the science data uh, behind pesticides. So you can go to NPIC and get a ton of information that is very user-friendly, um, layman language, very easy to understand. If you wanna know how a particular uh, chemistry works, is it safe for bees? Is it safe for aquatic life? What happens if my pet comes in contact with it? NPIC is where you want to go. I'm going to give you their website in a second, but if you just punch in National Pesticide Information Center, this is the first thing that will come up in your search, and I highly recommend uh, bookmarking it and, and taking a look at it. It is just a wealth of information. And last, there's Chemtrek. That's another good place for information. Chemtrek is your uh, poison control website, if you accidentally spill a pesticide, how do I clean it up? What if, heaven forbid, the kids or a pet comes in contact? Chemtrek also has a 24-7 um, uh, people manned phone line that you can call if there's accidental poisoning. I have the phone number available later in the uh, on a slide. It's also um, information that's on every pesticide label. And speaking of the label, uh, the label is federal law. Uh, the label for a pesticide is not like a label when you buy a vac or, uh, a label or direction booklet like when you buy a vacuum cleaner. It is federal law. You are supposed to read the, the label from front to back. Um, it, it is controlled. Uh, it is what the companies are mandated to put out. Uh, this photograph recently, if anybody subscribes to Garden Gate magazine, they featured a Bonide product. They featured uh, their new burnout organic uh, weed killer. Uh, as an example of a pesticide label and they took it apart and they literally went through it section by section. Every pesticide label basically has the, the same format. They're required by law to have the same format. Um, I wish I could give you that Garden Gate article, but instead, again, there's that National Pesticide Information Center website at the bottom of the screen. It's NPIC. Dot Oregon State, O-R-S-T, 
www.edu. And then if you do forward slash health, forward slash read label, or it has a really neat search engine, you could put in the search engine uh, how to read a pesticide label, and that will walk you through the different parts of a pesticide label. And I say read from front to back. When you go to the store, you literally, before you purchase that product, you should peel that back label apart. Um, if you're nervous about doing that, ask the person in the store to help you out. You should read it before you buy it. I realize that it could be an eye test because the booklets are small. Keep in mind that most companies, uh, Bonai does it, but just about every company will post their labels on the website. They're, they're in eight and a half by 11 format. Most of them are in PDF form. So you can literally download them to the, your computer and save them. And they're a lot easier to read that way. But read from the front to the back because a lot of times if you just read the front, you forget about the back part of the label. All pesticide labels are required to give any environmental hazards. This just happens to be a sample of one. And now they're, already, they're also required to put out if they're a pollinator hazard. So most of the pesticide companies now are required by law to put bee hazard information on there. And you wouldn't see it if you only read the first two pages because a lot of times this is towards the back of the label. You also wanna look at what the insect uh, control is and what plant you're going to spray because the insect you're trying to control or the disease you're trying to control plus the plant that you're gonna use the product on has to be on the label in order for you to use it. If it's not, and the label is the law, then it's illegal to use that particular product on that plant. So a little pesticide 101, so you're familiar with the terminology. There are different formulations of pesticides. Some of them come in granular form. These are meant to be applied to the soil. They're never to be mixed with water. There are ready to use spray formulations. This is the one that is the most common and the easiest to use. They're abbreviated RTU, which stands for ready to use. There's also RTSs, ready to sprays. They're similar in that they're pre-formulated, but there's a, a different type of nozzle at the top because RTSs are units that can hook up to your hose and then your hose draws them out at the right dilution rate. I don't have a photo of an RTS, but RTUs and RTSs are probably the most common forms. Then there's liquid concentrates. These are meant to be diluted with water and used in a pump sprayer or a tank sprayer or a backpack sprayer. Um, less common are dusts. Dusts um, either come in the format that you see here with a little point on the top of their applicator because they're meant to be squeezed and the dust is puffed onto the leaf surface. If you buy a dust in a bag, you really need to have a dust applicator so that you can puff the product onto the leaf. They're a little tricky to use and so they're not as common. Um, all pesticide products have two sets of ingredients. The ingredients are always on the front and they have an active ingredient, which is the main chemical. They also have what's called an other ingredient or what's sometimes called an inert ingredient. These are typically um, the sticking agent. They might be water, they might be an oil, they might be um, a, a solution or a material that makes the shelf life better. Um, usually, nine times out of 10, there's a sticking agent in there that allows the active ingredient to stick to the plant better. I'm going to talk a little bit about other ingredients later in the presentation. What's a minimal risk pesticide? There are some pesticides that the EPA has determined that they're not a risk to human health or the environment. Therefore, they don't have to be registered. A good example of a minimal risk pesticide that you're probably familiar with is citronella. Citronella is technically a type of pesticide, but it's considered minimal risk. 
and so it's not registered and it's, it's usually easy to obtain as well. Um, then there's the opposite, which is a restricted use pesticide. All the pesticides that you can buy in any kind of uh, nursery store or big box stores, those are what they call general use or homeowner use. You can buy them and you can use them. Restricted use, on the other hand, you'll never find in a store. They're not available to a homeowner. They're only to be used by a person that has a certified pesticide applicator's license. Um, I, I mentioned restricted use simply because if you do a Google search, if you're out there trying to find out, for example, what's good for termite control, we'll just use that as an example. When you do a Google search, um, they might mention an ingredient and then you run to the store and you can't find it. Well, Google searches don't differentiate between what's a homeowner available pesticide and what's a restricted use pesticide. And so it's important to understand that if, if they mention a restricted use product that would be good for termites, unfortunately, you won't, as a homeowner, won't be able to get it. You can only have access to it if a certified professional applicator gets it and use and actually has to apply it. You can't. So just so that you understand the difference. And then there's this concept of what's legal in New York State. Every state uh, decides what pesticides they want for sale and for use in their state. And unfortunately, they can be different in different states. So there could be a product that's for sale and for use in Pennsylvania, but it's not for sale or for use in New York. And because of that state differentiation, you cannot take a pesticide that's for sale and use in Pennsylvania and bring it across the border into New York. That's illegal. And as I said, the New York Department of Environmental Conservation decides what's legal to be sold and to be used in the state. There was a time I'd have to explain what PPE is, but I think under the current circumstances, you all know what PPE is. I'm gonna show you an example of what the PPE is for, or the personal protection equipment for using pesticides on the next slide. I wanna just bring up PHI, that stands for pre-harvest interval. That's important if you're using a pesticide on vegetable and edible crops. Even organic pesticides might have PHI intervals. And what that is, is the number of days you can use a pesticide before you can actually pick and eat the fruit. So even some organics might say two day pre-harvest interval. So what that means is you can't pick or harvest that fruit for two days after you've sprayed it with a pesticide. So keep an eye on PHI when you pick up a product. And I mentioned uh, personal protective gear um, and we're gonna talk safety now. I mean, you wanna prepare yourself. Um, this is a typical, this is a great example of what you need to wear when you're using pesticides. You don't need a hazmat suit for homeowner use pesticides, but you do wanna wear long pants, long sleeves, gloves, uh, some eye protection, a mask is a good idea, uh, a hat is a great idea. This is the typical gear you would wanna wear to be safe, to make your person safe. Uh, we're gonna talk about ways to keep the environment safe when we talk about actually how to apply them. So we talked about the protective gear. I included a picture of a respirator here. Um, homeowner use, you don't have to use a respirator. Respirators are required for the people with the professional license uh, to apply pesticides. Uh, but that doesn't mean you, don't, you can't wear one. It's just not a requirement. Just a plain dust mask is enough uh, for pesticides. And again, read the label because the safety gear is always spelled out on the label. So how long do pesticides last? Well, they really don't have any specific shelf life. In fact, if you pick up a pesticide, you won't see an expiration date on there. Um, how long the pesticide lasts is really dependent on how you store it. You don't want it to freeze. 
and you don't want it to be in a spot where it's going to sit in the direct sunlight or be in a location where the temperatures are going to exceed 90 degrees. Uh, those two are, are, the, are extremes that could affect the shelf life. However, even if they do freeze or they do get subjected to that, technically they don't go bad. They could lose some of their effectiveness. Um, typically what I like to do when I buy a pesticide is I like to mark with a marker the day um, I open it because generally speaking, once you open a pesticide, most of your pesticides will last anywhere from five to seven years after you open them. If they're bacteria based or those biologics I was talking about, then it's less than five years. But the only way you're gonna know is to actually use it and why fill a, land, you know, fill a landfill with, with unused pesticides. Just go ahead and use it um, do what you can to make sure that they're stored properly. That's gonna, going to ensure that it has the good shelf life. In terms of disposal, um, in New York State, uh, burning any empty containers of pesticides is illegal. So burning is not an option in New York State. If they're empty containers in New York State, they are not recycled. Um, they are disposed of as trash. What you want to do is poke a couple, two or three holes in the container first, and then just dispose of that empty container as regular trash. Um, if you have some pesticides you don't want to use, or you don't know how old they are, or if maybe they've um, been, you know, suddenly listed as illegal or they're no longer available, uh, maybe you've just got some you want to get rid of. They're treated as hazardous waste. Um, and in New York State, they've determined that each county uh, determines how to take care of that hazardous waste. So in Oneida County, it's the Oneida County Solid Waste Authority. Um, once we get past the current uh, environment we're under, uh, they'll open up and they'll have collection times for um, other hazardous kitchen chemicals. And so pesticides are disposed of in that way and there's no charge for turning them in. Um, always have this, this is the 24-7 um, hotline number I mentioned. It's on all pesticide labels, but in theory, you should probably have it handy in case, heaven forbid, something happens. You can locate it uh, quickly. I want to talk just a second if you decide to use concentrates. You know, the ready to use and the ready to sprays are great. They're easy to use because they're pre-formulated. You don't have to do anything except spray them. With concentrates, you've got to mix them with water. So there's a little bit of a, a trick to that. And I just wanted to talk about that for a second. Most important, follow the instructions. I like to use the example of making a cake, even though I should not be the example of talking about cakes because I am not known for my baking talents. Um, but you know what I've learned the hard way is that if it says three quarters of a teaspoon, you don't eyeball it or you don't use one tablespoon teaspoon or you don't say oh i'll use two you know i'll use a quarter it's the same thing with pesticide if they say an eighth of a teaspoon which sounds kind of strange they mean an eighth of a teaspoon they don't mean a half that doesn't say oh if i use a half maybe it'll be better no you need to follow the instructions and use the dilution rates exactly as they're portrayed in the instruction booklet. And then you always want to have some water in your sprayer first and then add the product after, uh, not the other way around. Um, some products, when they start to mingle with the water, they like to sink to the bottom. And so it's a good idea when you're using a, a pump sprayer or a tank sprayer Keep it, keep it agitated. So shake it, you know, occasionally stop, take a break, shake it a little bit just to make sure that the pesticide is mixing with the water. And then always uh, rinse your sprayer two or three times after you use it. Um, that water that's in there as you're rinsing it is commonly known as rinse aid, and you want to make sure you dispose of that properly. 
Uh, typically, take that rinse aid and spray a plant that's listed on the label with the rinse aid. Or you could go on the edge of your property and spray uh, on the edge of your property that rinse aid. Never let it run off to where it's going to go into a drainage ditch or it's going to go down the road. You'd never want to dump it in a drain or a toilet. You need to make sure you're disposing of it properly. And then don't store diluted solution. Uh, you want to only mix what you're going to use. Um, already diluted solution really only lasts about 48 hours. After that, bacteria can enter and it can actually start to break down and it can actually do more damage to your plants. So only mix what you're going to use um, and, and not uh, store already diluted solution. I know I've, I've, I used to answer this question a lot at Bonide. People want to make a big mix of it because maybe they're going to use it today and then they might be spraying again in a week. Not a good idea because believe it or not, bacteria can get in there. You can cause more harm than good. So just like people, um, plants can get allergic reactions to pesticides. You know, some plants are just overly sensitive and a fancy term for pesticide damage is phototoxicity. It's essentially alert, an allergic reaction. And you can avoid allergic reactions by applying pesticides at the right time. Never apply a pesticide on a windy day. You would be surprised um, if, for example, weed killers, you would be surprised uh, how far overspray can go, even in the lightest of winds. So, and plants are super sensitive to herbicides. So never apply on a windy day, never apply pesticides when temperatures are less than 40. And most pesticides, you don't even wanna think about applying if the feels like temperature is more than 90 degrees. Um, in fact, you should never uh, apply a pesticide when it's that hot because chances are you're gonna burn the plants. Um, also, try to apply on a cloudy day if you can, because direct sunlight and pesticides sometimes by themselves cause a phototoxic uh, reaction. Um, it's, it's best if you can try uh, for a cloudy day, that's actually the best time to apply. Um, surfactants, be careful using a surfactant. That's a fancy word for an additive. Some people like to add uh, sticking agents to pesticides. Um, there are actual products out there that are actually just called surfactants. Um, many pesticides already have a surfactant built in. So if you add another one, you can actually make that product a lot stronger and potentially damage a plant. So only add a surfactant if the label says you can. Uh, never mix pesticides together unless the label specifies. A lot of people think, well, I'll mix the insecticide with the fungicide together and then I could just do one spray. Unless the label says you can do that, don't. Um, your sprayers, um, never use a sprayer. I, I guess this is a personal opinion because I want to separate the opinion from the fact I just don't think it's a good idea to use a sprayer that you may have used weed killer in and then turn around and use it uh, for an insecticide or a fungicide. Even when you do that rinsing two or three times, it is very difficult to get weed killer or herbicide residue out of a sprayer. So if you want a sprayer for weeds, you should dedicate that sprayer to just weed control products. And I think you'd be better off getting a second sprayer for fungicides or insecticides or fertilizer use. It does not take much um, herbicide damage or herbicide overspray rather to damage plants. And then never uh, apply a pesticide to a plant that's already stressed. If it's, if it's wilting, if it has yellowed foliage on it already, applying an, a pesticide is just going to exacerbate the problem. 
This is a photograph of a squash leaf that had herbicide overspray get on it and not very much. This is from the University of Maryland and you could see it pretty much shriveled up that squash leaf. This is what typical uh, uh, phototoxicity from a pesticide, what the damage looks like. And as you can see, sometimes the typical damage is hard to differentiate between it and maybe insecticide damage. Typically, it looks like this, spots on the foliage. Uh, some plants are just super sensitive in general. Japanese maples, for example, are super sensitive to pesticide products. But again, if you read your label, many times they'll, they'll not only list the plants that are sensitive, but they'll tell you to do a test spray. And it's actually always a good idea to do a test spray, especially if you're spraying a plant that for the first time you've never sprayed it before and you don't know how it's going to react. Do a test spray, which involves taking two or three uh, leaves of the plant or a very small section, spray it, wait 48 hours. If you don't see any adverse reaction to it, then that's a good sign that plant can tolerate it. And so then you can go back and spray the rest of the plant. This is an example of, of leaves where they took two products and mixed them together and they were incompatible and you can see it essentially burned the plant. And then this example is interesting. A lot of organic options that we're gonna talk about in a, in a second have oil in them. And oil does funny things to certain kinds of plants. This is an evergreen, this is a blue spruce. Many oil products will discolor colored evergreens. So what this is showing you is they used an oil-based product and the blue spruce color is disappearing. It, what happens is oil will make the plant revert back to its green color. It's not permanent, but th so the new growth that comes out, as you can see here, is coming out blue, but it's obviously not gonna be very pleasing if you bought that plant because you wanted the blue color. Again, read the label because all oil products will tell you don't use this as oil-based, do not use this product on a colored evergreen. So just an example. So is the pesticide I'm using organic? Well, it, can, it, it is only organic if it has one of these two symbols on them, the four organic gardening symbol or the OMRI symbol. The OMRI is Organic Management Review Institute. They're essentially Similar, they're just as rigorous certifications. It's just that OMRI caters more to agriculture and to entities that want to sell their produce as organic. Uh, the four organic gardening logo is typically for a homeowner product, but they're both as strict. Organic means different things to different people, but in terms of pesticides, organic just means least uh, or the less toxic, I should say. It's organic is never non-toxic, as I'll show you in a second. Even some organic products are, for example, toxic to pollinators. So uh, be careful. In the terms of a pesticide, it's really your less toxic option, but never non-toxic. I'm going to show you an example of a label uh, with these markings on it. Here's an example. This particular product is certified for both. So chances are um, this can be a homeowner product because it has the four organic gardening uh, logo on it, but it's also a product that an organic farmer can use because it has the OMRI label. This is an example of what the active ingredient listing looks like. You'll see other ingredients on there. Um, and then at the bottom, you see the EPA registration number. Um, I know the other ingredients could be alarming to people. Unfortunately, the way the laws are right now, companies are not required to list the other ingredients. Frankly, I think that's probably gonna change over time because a lot of people um, see things like this and they wanna know what is that 99.9% .9 that's in this product. I happen to know probably this particular product is probably majority of it is water. It's probably a sticking agent. Um, 
Just so you know, the other ingredients have to go through the same approval process as the active ingredients are. If you're interested in knowing what other ingredients could be, that's where that NPIC, the National Pesticide Information Center, will be helpful to you. Unfortunately, it won't tell you uh, the specifics product by product, but you'll at least get an idea what could be in that 99.9%. Um, you need to know what's wrong with your plant in order to pick the right product. That can be a little overwhelming because a lot of things can, you know, some things look like insects, some insects look like diseases. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you some resources that can help you with good identification because before you use any product, you need to identify the problem because remember what I said before, the problem and the plant has to be on the label for you to be able to legally use that pesticide. So using insecticides, let's talk about that for a second. When you're using insecticides, you have to know about the insect life cycle because products will attack different life cycles. For example, some oil products will do great smothering the insect eggs, but they're not going to do anything for the adult moth. Um, some products like BT will work great on the larvae form, but they're going to do nothing with the pupa stage or they're going to do nothing with the moth. It's very important to understand life cycle and also to recognize uh, the different life cycles as to when they're going to occur. And it's important because it, it, it's going to impact how the insecticide works. Uh, since we're only talking about organic products, um, mode of action, which is a fancy word for how does the product kill the bug, um, organic products only work on contact. That means the insect either has to come in contact with the product or some contact killers will make the plant surface toxic. So when the insect goes to eat the plant, he ingests the product and then he dies of a stomach poison. Um, so with a contact insecticide, which is what most of your organics are, you, you can't use it until you actually see the insect. So you can't use it ahead of time, in other words, to prevent the insect from coming. You literally have to be able to see the insect. So this is why that life cycle is critical you know, getting to know your insects, Japanese beetles, my buddies and pals, that's what this photograph is showing. Um, I always use the 4th of July as the target for Japanese beetles because you could probably depend on the probably the first Japanese beetle being seen around the 4th of July. And so sometimes knowing that information is going to help you to know when to start using uh, insecticides. Unfortunately, with contact insecticides, you're going to have to reapply them often. Read the label. Most of them will say, some will say two to three days, every two to three days. Some will say five to seven days. Obviously, you have to reapply them often uh, because they're moving all the time. You'll have one flush of the insect today, and then two days later, you may have more insects. And contact killers are not rainproof. So if it if you sprayed today, for example, it's not a good example with 20 degree wind chill, but if you sprayed today and then it rained tonight, you've lost your coverage. So what that means is when the plants dry, so for example, if it stops raining tomorrow, you can actually spray again. So contact killers are not rainproof. Here are your active ingredients that are all organic insect killers. Um, and I say less toxic because the ones with an asterisk next to them have pollinator issues. Uh, the ones with asterisks can be toxic to bees when they're wet. And so they're only toxic when they're wet. So when the products dry on the plant, it's perfectly fine for the bees. And so these are examples of products and as to why even if you're going to spray organic options, do it at the time of the day when the pollinators are not active. That's either very early in the morning or later in the day at dusk 
uh, they, the bees will return to their hive. And so if you need to spray those asterisk uh, organic products, then do it when the bees aren't active. Obviously, if it's a non-flowering plant, it's not an issue. Um, just want to point out that spinosad and the BT strains are examples of biologics. Um, I wish we could get into these in more detail, but we don't have time tonight. Um, you will be able to get copies of my slides, by the way, if you ask for them. And so you'll have this list. These are all active ingredients that you would see on the front of the label. Um, essential oils, in case you're not familiar with those, there's a whole slew of them. Uh, hot pepper wax, for example, is an essential oil. Cedar oil is an essential oil. There's a whole slew of them that are insect killers. Now fungicides and, and killing plant disease is totally different. With, in, with, with the insecticide, you have to see the insect first in order to apply an insecticide. With fungicides, that's not the case. It's what causes the disease that's critical. So, to have a plant disease, you basically need three things. You need the stress plant or the host. You need the pathogen, which is always in the air. It could be a fungus spore, it could be a bacteria. And then what makes those two things active is the environment. And most of the time that's moisture. Excessive moisture is usually the environmental factor that triggers a plant disease. That could be wet soil, wet foliage, high humidity, poor air circulation. So knowing that the environment is present for a disease is critical and that's what's important to determine when to use a fungicide. And it's all because of the mode of action. With a fungicide, when you look at this photograph, this is black spot on roses. When the black spot has actually appeared, like in this photograph, it's essentially too late to apply a fungicide you won't be able to cure the black spot because all of your organic fungicides are contact killers and they only kill the new germinating fungi. So they will not reverse existing damage. So if you sprayed this plant right now, that black spot on those leaves would stay. You could probably slow down the spread, but that you will not reverse the damage. It, fungicides prevent infection. So that's why it's critical when you see a lot of wet weather or there's a lot of moisture in the air or your plants are overly wet, you have to start spraying fungicides as a preventative before the disease comes. And plants are, are susceptible to a disease when they've developed their new leaves, which is about four to six weeks into the growing season, when they've established all their new foliage, they're, they're prone to get a disease and all you need is the wet environment. And so fungicides are literally applied as a preventative, not as a curative. And these are examples of organic fungicides. Notice the horticulture oil and the neem are on the list. They actually, can kill insects and kill some diseases. They have that pollinator issue, which I've asterisk. And then these are your typical organic fungicides, the BT strains we talked about uh, earlier. Um, just a quick, as we're towards the end of my presentation here, I just wanna mention that sometimes you might not have a disease, you might not have an insect, you have a virus on your plants. And viruses, there is no cure. There are no products to spray. When your plant has a virus, it literally has to be removed and destroyed. Um, these are two uh, typical, uh, I don't want to say typical, but they're more common viruses. Um, on the left is what they call witch's broom or rose rosette. It attacks roses. Um, and on the right is a virus called aster yellows, which attacks uh, coneflowers and members of the daisy family. Typically with a virus, you're, you're, you may see distorted growth, but that's not always the case. 
So that's why diagnosis is very, very important and knowing exactly what's wrong with your plants is critical to determine whether you've got uh, a disease or an insect or in this case, a virus. So in summary, we talked about all these things. Um, one thing I didn't mention is keeping a journal because noting what went wrong with your plants and when you may not be able to tackle it this year, but it's gonna help you next year to be more proactive. And a lot of times with diseases and insects, it's all about knowing the times of the year uh, when they appear. And I said I was gonna leave this slide up. These are the uh, where to go for help uh, websites. We talked about MPIC. Um, I'll leave this up for a second too, since my presentation is done. Um, the New York State Integrated Pest Management. Cornell's Insect Diagnostic Laboratory is great. You'll see pictures of uh, insects so that you'll be able to properly identify, as well as their plant disease clinic. You'll see pictures of diseases and you can uh, try to diagnose there. Bon Ives website is great as well. They also have an app, a phone app that you can download from their website that gives all kinds of not only insect and disease pictures if you want to identify weeds. The Bonite app will give you uh, weed identification and then it'll identify some products that you can use to mitigate those problems. And then I listed um, some phone apps that you can take a look at. Um, Gardenize is a nice one if you want to say journalize electronically using your phone, try the app uh, Gardenize. Um, and so with that, I think I could turn it over to Holly. Uh, I just want to, I wanted to leave this up for a second, but if, again, if you ask for copies of my slides, um, they can be sent to you. Um, and I'd be happy to share this information with you. Um, I hope these are some resources and credits. Uh, don't forget our Oneida County website, cceoneida.com. Our Master Gardener hotline number is there for gardening questions. Um, and these are some of the other resources that I use to put together uh, the presentation that you saw tonight. 